Good morning, good afternoon to everyone out there in the world. I've seen we have people from Peru to Sydney, we have Americans, we have Europeans, very few Germans this time, so very international crowd. It's wonderful to have you here again for episode 14 of our Rise of AI virtual chat. My name is Fabian Westerheiner, I'm an entrepreneur and investor with a passion for artificial intelligence, and I love to invite interesting people to this show to ask them all the questions I have in me. So topic today is, you see it on the shirt, it's the future of warfare and AI. And um, just to give you a good example, France has a national AI defense strategy where they, I've, I've read it this morning, where they've written on dozens of pages how they use AI and technology for their national defense. If you look for Germany, nothing like this exists. So we already see the discrepancy. It's a relevant topic in China and the United States. I think it's touching us all. Even if we don't serve in the military, it has an impact on us and in the future also if you want to prevent this. So the best guest for this is Dr. Ulrike Franke, who is already in the green room and I will have her live in a few minutes. She has a PhD from Oxford and wrote about the use of drones by Western armed forces. She did her masters um, about the German military revolution which is needed and it's not coming uh, in St. Paul and St. Gaul. She works today for the European Council of Foreign Affairs. So it's an NGO and a think tank which is mainly focused on foreign policy in Europe. And within this, she's focused on defense and security. And she has published a lot about future of warfare, drones, AI, and she has her own podcast. So if you want to listen more to her, if you want to dig more to this topic, it's a Sicherheitshalber podcast. I'm sure someone will post it in the chat. And well, let's bring her online. Hi. Hello, a wonderful good morning. Ah, it's good. So you're in London, I'm in Berlin, and uh, we talked today about Europe, AI, military. And you decided you want to have the hardest question at the beginning. <laughs> That's always good. Which is, will AI end wars? No, is the very short answer. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, this is really one of those things that you hear a lot. There's always a new technology. I mean, in history, there's always a new technology being invented and someone hopes like this really will mean that there will be no more wars. Um, I mean, we had this hope with nuclear weapons, by the way. Um, oh, interesting. And okay. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that didn't happen. Um, I mean, with nuclear weapons, the idea was that war would just be too terrible um, for, for it to happen. I think with AI, People who argue this, and there aren't that many, um, would probably say that if you have a lot of AI in warfare, it doesn't necessarily mean that it ends wars, but you would have less people or no people. I mean, it's basically this idea of, of let the machines fight it out. Um, and as much as I like this scenario, although it's a bit, it's a bit tricky, um, I absolutely do not believe in it. Because what we have seen time after time with new technologies in warfare is that they basically come on top of everything that already um, exists. I mean, sometimes it does replace certain things. Of course, you know, we don't need, we don't use bone error anymore. But, but usually there's always this element of, yes, yeah, sure, you have new te technological capabilities, but in the end, you always have the kind of 18 year old soldier dying somewhere in the mud. And this really is very important to me because I don't I don't want to create this, this idea that, you know, AI warfare and cyber warfare can just mean that we don't have this anymore and it's all going to be great. I, I absolutely do not believe in this. OK, that's a, um, I thank you for this answer. It's a good indication. So let's jump in the examples, the easy one to explain everyone's on the same level. We speak mainly about autonomous weapons and we have seen it. There was a backlash in Silicon Valley. I think Amazon went out and Microsoft went out of contracts. They all don't want to do military defense. So it is a topic. People discuss it. I think there is signatures by 100 or 1000 companies and private people and researchers about we don't want to have autonomous weapons. Still, they exist. Let's talk a little bit about, about real life cases. Yeah, it's out there already. So 
The first thing to say is that, and as you know, and, and all the, the listeners probably know, first of all, even defining AI is a bit tricky, right? AI can mean a number of things. And AI in the military realm also can mean a number of things. And it really is a is a full range, right? So at the, let's call it the lower end, you could have AI-enabled systems that, that basically just do like, you know, automation and then certain things are easier, you know, stabilizing a drone so it doesn't fly away in the wind, stuff like that. Um, and then at the other end of the, the range, you would have what a lot of people consider basically Terminator weapons, right? The fully autonomous system that can engage targets on its own. Um, and and this is this is the range that we have. And the extreme cases are somewhat easy, right? Because I think you can all agree, you know, the, the lowest level is, is perfectly fine. It makes a lot of sense. And the extreme level, we probably don't don't want this. But the question is, you know, where are we in, in the middle? So that's the first thing to mention. And the second thing is that you mentioned autonomous weapons, right? But this isn't the only use case for AI in the military realm. Uh, you can have a lot of different ways of using AI in, in the military realm. So Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR, as we say in, in, in the military, right? How so, do you, how do you call it? R? I, ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, okay. or ISTAR also sometimes exists. But anyway, so this is basically, you know, surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, and here, AI can do a, a lot of, you know, very useful things. Basically, right. look through all this huge amount of data that 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 the military is collecting, um, shift through this data, and find something um, that's out of the ordinary, um, targets, etc. So the you just mentioned um, uh, Silicon Valley companies having issues with working with the Pentagon, right? The one case that was a lot in the media was this project Maven, um, mm -hmm. a, a, a project where Google worked with the Pentagon um, in order to, what, to do what? Well, to use AI to look through all the videos that US drones had collected. Mm -hmm. And here the idea really is, you know, to find to find something that's out of the ordinary, find IED, so so improvised explosive devices, find find targets, find a lot of things. Here we're not talking about killer robots, we're not talking about armed systems. This is really just, you know, surveillance, but this is AI enabled. So this is one example. And you have AI, you could have AI in logistics, in cyber operations. Um, in, in forecasting and war games. So AI in the military isn't just lethal autonomous weapons. Is Palantir also involved with the military in the United States? I, I know that Palantir, um, so the, the data um, uh, broker or, or analysis company, um, they've been working a lot with border security mm. in, in the US. Um, I don't know for certain that they're working with the, the Pentagon, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and in fact, the, the Pentagon in particular has been has been trying a lot to work with Silicon Valley companies, um, which side note really shows us how important civilian companies are in this whole realm, which is something that's relatively new for, for um, we will the We'll discuss state. this. It's like, mm -hmm. is it, so I have, a, I have a list from the French AI strategy for defense. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, they say, okay, we use AI for communication, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, collaborative combat. That reminds me of my former portfolio company, Accelerated Dynamics, which had the swarm intelligence to control hundreds of drones and submarines to build mesh networks which adapt uh, that they never die, uh, which is an adaptive communication network, which is flying yeah. or floating, and it's always adapting. Um, we speak about submarines, mines, detection, but also placement, land robotics, you know, what we know from Boston Dy Dynamics, transport, aircrafts, connected soldiers, um, which is combat suits. And I think, let me try, I think it's, it's there. there. <laughs> Where is it? That's a drone? There is it. Right. Yes, it's it's augmenting, it's augmenting, not replacing, but augmenting yeah. the soldier. You have a hut, you see the data, you get feeds in. It is like combat suits, uh, exoskelets. Um, we speak about satellites, uh, typical in intelligence, as you say, like ISR, command cyberspace. And from your master thesis, I mean, nine years ago, you wrote about this and you wrote about precision guided munition or stealth technologies. Um, we all think it's science fiction, but what I read in the news, and I'm, I'm curious in this, it's all real. It, it's a lot out there, not as fancy as we believe, but m more fancy than most people think. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that is my point. Um, I always try to not just talk about military AI, but about AI enabled systems, mm -hmm. because AI isn't as technology as such, right? Um, and, and this is what I meant earlier about this, this full range. Um, AI can mean a lot of things and AI enabled systems can do a lot of a lot of things and the level of uh, of autonomy you give these systems really depends on well on, on the developer on on the, the decision makers so there's a lot of possibility for us to shape how we use this but maybe maybe it would be useful um, um, for the listeners to kind of have an overview of like why do we generally want to use AI enabled systems in, in the military realm. And I would really kind of emphasize five points. And this is from a military yes. perspective, right? So, so, so you can say you don't like those, but no, you give yeah. us your five points because we have plenty of questions currently coming in, which oh, right, is really okay. good. So I will sort the questions and you well, tell I us your five points. Okay. Okay. So basically the five reasons why militaries pretty much all over the world really are interested in using AI to enable their weapon systems. Um, the first one is speed, right? So if you have AI enabled systems, you can do a number of things faster. Why? Well, because human beings just generally take more time, especially looking through data and, and, and deciding on certain things. Um, computers can more or less, you know, analyze an, an unlimited number of, of, of data and take a decision on it. And speed, of course, is super important in warfare and especially in defense. If you want to defense again, def defend against an attack, being able to do things quickly, super important. That's the first one. The second one is stealth. So the ability to hide yourself. Mm -hmm. This is one that's interesting for me because I'm, I'm coming from the kind of drone world. I've always been interested in, in drones. And the drones that we have at the moment are pretty vulnerable and pretty easy to detect. I'm generalizing massively, but kind of go with me. Um, and one of the reasons why they're easy to detect is that drones that we have at the moment have an uplink and a downlink. So mm -hmm. the, the drone operator needs to send a signal to the drone um, to tell it what to do, and the drone sends back the data it is gathering. Let me jump in here. There yeah. is a not proven rumor, but I believe it, that um, ISIS used in the drone war um, um, GPS jacker, uh, hijacking mm -hmm. exactly to, to, to go against this up and cross link. And there's a saying that once the drone had its goals, it was able with image recognition to discover the goal, identify it and make the kill decision on its own. But no one is really saying this in public because this is against the law and even in the United States. Right. Yeah. So we. So so you mentioned an important point, which is non-state actors increasingly using all these capabilities um, and and um, also being able to kind of jam them or, or hack into them. We had a situation years ago where Hezbollah basically hacked into Israeli drone feeds and were able to see what they were seeing and so knew where the attacks were were gonna come. Right. So. Um, exactly. So this is the uplink and the downlink. Mm -hmm. um, and the and the problem with this uplink and downlink is. As you say, you know, this can be detected, this can be hacked, and there's also a certain element of lag time in there. Now, if you give a drone a certain amount of autonomy, mm -hmm. which is AI enabled, then you can make them more stealthy because you don't need this uplink and downlink anymore. So that's that's kind of second second advantage of why you would use AI in the military. Um, the third one is is an easy one. We're always striving towards is efficiency and cost reduction. That's, you know, definitely debatable because it really depends on what AI system you're talking about. A lot of them might be way more um, um, expensive than others. But the idea, of course, is that if you can use AI, you may need, you know, less people um, uh, and, and it just becomes more efficient, faster, um, all of this. Related to this, I just said it, is the need for less people. So right now, actually, drone operations are super people intensive. Mm -hmm. um, it's tricky to come... To have the exact numbers, but for you know use of an, an armed drones by the Americans, some say you need over a hundred people involved um, in the, one way or another. Too. And they're yeah, I mean again, it depends on what you what you compare it Software to. Software and hardware less... and processes it makes them very expensive. And I think the prices we have less physical death as humans. I mean the the, the, mm -hmm. the amount of soldiers dying goes down since Second World War, but the price is still going up. So at the end, you pay more per human surviving. Yeah, I mean, price, the costs here are really tricky because 
here the big question is what you compare it to. So a Predator drone, sure, you can say it's expensive, but of course it's much less expensive than a manned fighter. I mean, the current you know, F-35 okay. fighter that the U US is, is developing, I mean, we're talking billions. Um, drones are nowhere near, but they also can't do exactly the same thing. Right. But so you may, with AI, you may need less people. And also you may be able to take off some of the load from people. And we're talking both physical, we're just mm -hmm. talking about, you know, um, uh, the infantry soldier yeah, of the ha future. Having a Boston Dynamic robot just with your, your gear, you know, whatever you need luggage, you're crossing a certain country and they can carry 200 kilograms on top. Ex you know, how you normally use small vehicles or it's adaptive. Yeah, exactly. So the physical thing is one bit, but the cognitive part is also very important. Mm. So um, again, talking about data analysis, at the moment, you have quite a lot of people just looking at data and analyzing it. And a lot of it is, is boring and dull. And, and it's, it's tricky for humans to do this because we get bored looking at the same piece of land for like three hours. Um, and so AI, AI can really help to, to right. lift this kind of cognitive load. And then finally, the fifth point, and this for me is really the most important one and the most interesting one, is that AI, so goes the theory, offers new military capabilities. Mm -hmm. And this really is the holy grail of what the military wants, right? I mean, of course, you want you know stuff to be cheaper and easier and all of that, sure. But you want to have a head start, an advantage, so no one is fighting exactly. you because they know they will lose. Exactly. You want something that others don't have. Mm -hmm. and, and new military capabilities enabled by AI is really what... what especially the advanced militaries are looking at. And here, the one thing I would highlight, and you already mentioned this earlier, is, is swarming, right? Mm -hmm. Having the ability of connecting several different units of military systems, be it, you know, airborne drone or under drones or underwater drones, all kinds of things. Being able to connect them in, in a swarm uh, can have enormous military capabilities. You can overwhelm air defenses, you can create well, basically flying minefields to, to occupy territory, you can do all kinds of things. And this is something where a lot of the, the work is currently currently done, because this could be a new military capability that really gives you this decisive advantage that you mentioned. There's this book, I think it was written by Suarez or William Hurtling, Kill Decision, recommended, mm -hmm. just describing state-of-the-art technology, how they combine a drone swarm with, um, with chemistry so that they're able to smell you. So mm -hmm. they identify the DNA, you know, the, 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 the smell, the, the, the chemistry, which we all have uniquely. And then they combine it with uh, the algorithm of uh, ants. Yes, war ants. And yeah. then they act like war ants. And I had once at the conference, Professor Tim Landgraf, who's researching swarm intelligence in animals to adapt this to AI. So all these pieces are out there. It's, it's, it's from my view, very interesting because I see all these pieces, but they are not yet and that's good, perfectly combined. So yeah. summary, AI is super important for, for military and the user factors. We have a couple of questions now. Yeah. And let me start with the one from Henrik. Um, he says, in my opinion, military procurement, at least in Germany, is not fast enough to keep up with the speed of AI innovation in the future. Are there any good examples from around the world where they do better at it? Yes and no. So yes, it's true that military procurement in the Bundeswehr is kind of notoriously slow uh, and, and tricky and it takes a lot of time. However, this debate exists in every single country. I mean, it's the same in the US, it's the same in Israel, countries that, you know, from our perspective are known to be super innovative and, and able to do stuff really quickly. So I hear the same thing in, in the Pentagon and, and elsewhere where they say it all takes way too long. Um, I think what this questions, what this question shows is the civilian realm here is really important. So let me take a step back. What we what we had um, basically since the 1950s is a situation where most of the technological advance advantage um, advances really came out of the state financed and very often military realm. Dark um, who financed exactly. Apple, uh, Google self driving cars. I mean, they all DARPA GPS, the internet. Ziri, by the way, and so far, yeah. they are all former um, military strategic investments, I call them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And so this is especially true for the US, but it was also true um, elsewhere, where really, you know, for decades, the really 
cutting edge stuff came out of out of military research or at least state financed research. And this has changed recently, and especially with AI. So this is why we're always talking about Silicon Valley and Pentagon going to Silicon Valley and talking to like Google and Facebook and all of this, because this is really, these are the, the companies that build the cutting edge um, uh, AI. And so what this means is that now the military has to has to buy from these civilian developers. And, and this already takes time. And while this is happening, the civilian developers can, can develop further. Um, and it's much easier to bring stuff onto the civilian market and in the military market, right? Because in the civilian market, yeah. you can have a beta test and you can put out, you know, one system that, that may not be perfect yet, but it can be improved afterwards. You really don't want to do this in the military no. realm, right? You want to be sure that stuff works. You don't want to have a Tesla autopilot fail. Um, exactly. I agree. I agree. Exactly. And I mean, we still, we still do this. So we do feel in the military, you do feel drones, you try them out and then you realize we had the situation in Iraq where they tried a drone system and it didn't work because it was basically running on the same frequency that the Iraqi telecommunication um, system. Like that, that wasn't great. Um, so th this still happens, right. but it, it just shows like how tricky this is. And this has, again, this has been a problem that has plagued every single military. It's true that the Bundeswehr struggles with this, but yeah, just to make the point, this really is a problem everywhere. And while you can streamline processes, there is no there is no perfect solution. No one does this perfect. So when when we were at this topic, uh, we discussed as a Silicon Valley has a cultural, you know, they take the hands off approach. Oh, we we are not a media company. We are not, you know, we don't want to have any regulation responsibility for the world. We're just tech. We're just doing tech. At the end, TensorFlow is running in drones. Yes, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that an image classifier is someone invented is running anywhere out there. So at the end, they use the open technologies, even if you don't provide directly to military, they use it. How? So your thesis is that more innovation comes from the private sector than it used to be in the past from the military. So my question is, where will we see innovation, which we all expect, because old economy, they they won't get it. They don't MVP. They don't do lean. They don't do testing they take forever we see with all the german european military projects that doesn't work i spoke with someone from the military said yeah we will have autonomous weapon systems by 2045 i yeah. expect a singularity by then <laughs> well okay but that's 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 a bit of an extreme uh, point of view yeah but this is my answer yeah. to him i'm like 2045 i'm uploaded yeah i don't need it then anymore it's like their time horizon is not realistic yeah um so the first part of your question i think is important in that i worry sometimes about this idea or this yeah this idea from silicon valley that they they can say we don't build for the military i mean some of them do but but there's this there's this idea right um we don't we don't build for the military this is all for good this is all for the civilian realm um there you go i think you can't have this approach if you're building something that can clearly be used for military purposes and just for nefarious purposes in general. It's not just armed forces by states. Um, it's also, you know, we mentioned on state actors, terrorist groups, et cetera, that can just repurpose these systems. And it's just not good enough to say, but we are only building this for good. So we aren't in any way responsible. Um, I actually worry that this approach leads to developers in, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere not thinking enough about how you could use these systems for, for mm -hmm. military and other, right. you know, purposes. So I think this is really important. So all the startup founders out there have this in your mind. Exactly. It. Exactly. Exactly. And it's absolutely fine to say we don't actually want to sell this to, you know, Airbus and, and General Atomics. Like that's an OK position. But saying, you know, we don't even want to think about this. That's that's not good enough and actually really dangerous. Um, about the kind of 2045 um, uh, thing. I mean, here again, we, we're coming back to developing this stuff and procuring this stuff just takes time. And, and, and 2040 or 2045 is, an, is a good um, date because this is also the date where one of the big ticket European items is supposed to to, to fly and to be used, and that's FCAS, the Future Combat Air System. Yeah, which this is, is what um, I had in mind. Yeah. Exactly. So that's an that's a, a European Franco-German or Franco-German Spanish project of a fighter jet mm -hmm. with drone swarms mm -hmm. that are in AI enabled and all these kind of things. Um, and this is a big ticket European item. We're talking, you know, a lot of money uh, being mm -hmm. invested, and and 
this is interesting in so far as they're all they're basically trying to develop something which doesn't doesn't exist yet and the technology doesn't exist yet so so this is why it, it takes so long um so i i yeah stuff stuff takes long i mean again and the the, the us f35 also took a long time to develop and still has its issues so so i'm not i'm not as shocked as you are when it comes I... to that i guess I, I, I mean, we both know Otto Jon, who was for four years the head of cyber in, of, of uh, let's say innovation hub at Bundeswehr, and I will have a virtual chat with him in a couple of weeks in September discussing this: how you get more innovation in the not only military but in the public sector. How can mm. you source innovation? How can you have open innovation? Because this needs to speed up. Uh, so, I mean, if you are ten years behind in your plan and the other one, I mean, we all have seen it. If you have the nuclear bomb and no one else has it, that's a huge head start. Um, mm -hmm. But this comes now, we have a couple of more questions. So yeah. one question from Joy. Joy wrote, thought I would chime in with my questions fairly early. How do you see AI impacting the various elements of the kill chain? And how do you see AI combining with cyber electronic and even space-based capabilities to achieve a combined effect in war? Yeah. Um... I think the cyber bit is important because so I don't specifically work on, on cyber related things, mm -hmm. but in one sentence, I basically would say, you know, everything I mentioned earlier about being, you know, it's not being faster and, and uh, uh, possibly cheaper and all of this, this is all true for cyber even more. Because the, the difference between the cyber world and the physical world is that in the cyber world, you basically don't have physical limitations. I mean, other than stuff like how fast data can can uh, go from A to B. But but there are basically no physical um, limitations. You don't actually need, a let's say, a drone swarm to take off and, and fly somewhere and, and, and do that kind of stuff. It is immediate. And so um, if you have AI-enabled systems in the cyber realm, all of this becomes even even more important and immediate. Uh, I think that's that's important to uh, to say. And with the kill chain, I mean, yes, that this is this is this, these are basically the different elements of, of what I mentioned. So data data collection you can you can do with more AI enabled systems. Data analysis we're just talking about this uh, you could do with AI enabled uh, systems. So that would be much faster. Finding targets would be um, can be much faster or much easier with AI enabled systems. So really at every point of the of the so-called kill chain, you can have AI. The big question basically is where do you want it to stop? Because at the end of the kill chain, of course, is the kill. So at the end of the kill chain, it's engaging a target and and possibly killing uh, another human being. And where where do you want AI to stop being the decisive factor? And this is a really good lead to the next question by Bing Zhang. Um, he says the true capabilities of AI and unmanned systems can only be realized through increasing the autonomy granted to those systems. How can the cultural issue regarding divorcing the kill decision from a person be managed? I mean, it's mm, tricky because I can, you can definitely have uh, systems where you use AI to do a number of things. Again, repeating myself, but data analysis, command control, all of these things. But then in the end, you say because of cultural civilizationary rules and and achievements and things that that we find important values we don't want the ai to take the final decision over life and death mm -hmm. um you can argue and you can create a scenario where this slows stuff down um mm -hmm. that's true but there is basically there's a there's a question of what's what's more important um, for you. Are there certain red lines you don't want to cross? And I think there are good arguments to not kind of not cross this final line where where it just as a computer who does the whole thing and and then takes the kill decision um, as well. So I don't. I mean, I guess I guess the person who asked the question is right in that it's the 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 all encompassing um, AI system would do all of this by itself. Um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, you can't use AI properly unless you give it like full autonomy. Like that's just no, not no, true. It's, and, but the more you yeah. give it, the more it can, it's faster, it's 
you know, at, at the end, it's just a speed thing. So you need to give it for maximum impact the most autonomy in steps. Yeah, okay. So this may be a good moment to talk about what we call manned unmanned teaming, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because there is a lot of research being done at the moment about how you can team up mm -hmm. human beings and AI enabled systems. And one of the reasons why militaries, but also outside of the military, um, they want to do this is exactly to have this kind of human control, make sure that there is a human on the leap. And that's a kind of you know, value-based decision. Fair enough, you can agree with it or not. But the other reason why we're doing this is also because so far, research has shown that manned unmanned teams are actually better at their jobs than just AIs. So you even have this in like chess, right, where we all, thought that, I mean, the computer has beat us, you know, ages ago, but if you team be. up, yeah. Also, uh, Kasparov lost 1997 against IBM Blue, then the yeah. teams were better. I agree, it's AI is augmenting us, but at the end, every chess computer on the cell phone is better than this. So if it's cheap enough, the technology and the learning is incremental, uh, at the end, only AI will be better. But in the meantime, this can be a very long meantime, the combination of both is the most proven and the best working for a very long period. Exactly. So I I wouldn't claim to know enough, and I'm not sure to what extent anyone can really be certain about this, but um, so, so I wouldn't claim that I, that I could say that definitely at the end, the AI is always going to, to be better. I don't know. But as you say, at the moment, in lots of area, we can show and prove that men on men teams are actually better. And this in a way is, you know, this is great news for all of those that want the meaningful human control and they want, they want humans in the loop because then you, you already have the, the human built in if you want and, and, and can make sure that there isn't too much autonomy um, to the AI system. This leads me to the, uh, to the movie War Games from the 17th. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a classical, especially under the current AI idea. Let's think for a second. So simulations are already run. I watched last weekend with my wife a documentary about uh, bunkers. And mm -hmm. they had a bunker where they showed all the nuclear bombs, where they would hit cities in Germany, the fallout and where the movement would be. So everything mm -hmm. was hand drafted and on the, depending on the salary, they had to move everything. Today, mm -hmm. AI makes running the simulation. And mm -hmm. I, I imagine one day AI will tell you it's worth fighting this or not, or even two AIs fight. I mean, we've seen this in the yes. Ukraine, where Russian military used a lot of AI to penetrate um, the infrastructure, water, electricity, and media, it was all hacked. It was all simultaneously hacked at the same di day and just shut down for two days just to prove that they can do it. And that was AI too. Yes. I mean, this in a way brings us brings us back to this idea of let's just the, the robots fight it out or in this extreme, mm -hmm. let's just the computer, let's, let's have the computer calculate who would win, right? Yes. And no one has to fight anymore. I yeah. mean, this is, this is great for a sci-fi movie. It's just that... <laughs> And this is basically the the, the material schlacht par excellence, right? Mm -hmm. You don't even, it's just literally just the material. So or some, even somewhere the... above of Russia and Siberia, thousands of drone clash and then it's done. And it's like one day and we just read it in the news. Hey, yeah, you're exactly. now part of the Chinese empire. Okay, and what do you do now? Because this, this for me is exactly the point, Two right? Um, like, like usual, I accept the protectorate, 90% would do it, and <laughs> you end up being a terrorist, or you, they call it guerrilla warfare, warfare or something like this. Okay, exactly, exactly. And the second point is important, because what, of, what would of course happen? I mean, if imagine we could have this perfect simulation, and China would say, actually, we are attacking the US now, and the computer calculates, and you know, one side wins. No way that the other side, the loser, would accept that outcome. What would happen is that you fight back. And this comes back to my point of you always have someone dying somewhere in the mud. I mean, in your mm -hmm. scenario, it would be the, the guerrilla fighter. Um, in mine, it would probably first or be the... Or just the... no electricity, no water, no internet. Yeah. You know, people yeah. die too in hospitals, etc. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah, that, that definitely, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I just, I just don't buy this idea of um, we can we can outsource, we can outsource warfare to, to computers or to robots and it's not going to touch us anymore because this is just not how, how human nature works. And um, I, I, don't, I don't believe in that, in that uh, scenario and in that future. So question by Konstantin. Um, 
Can you elaborate on the difference between military development and acquisition of AI compared to private civilian sector? How can the military leverage the private sector's innovative potential and where's the limitation of the corporation? And I mean, you touched it before, yeah. um, but it's still fair uh, because our innovation world is significant faster and cheaper. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess I, I'm not sure whether I have a great answer for this because the the answer basically is um, more cooperation um, and and making sure that the military is connected to the civilian um, developers and, and know what they're doing and and um, I think so. There are a few things that the the military can do to make it easier to work with the civilian realm. I mean. One of the things, for instance, is that military um, just just contract contracts with the military are notoriously slow and tricky, and it's pretty hard mm -hmm. to get military money, yes. which often means that for especially you know startups and the like, they just don't they have don't, the time. They, they don't the they exactly. They don't have the time to 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 do this this application and to wait for it, and then it takes ages. And by the time you know they may have gone bust, been bought by Google or whatever. So um, trying to, to speed that up um, would be would be good. And this isn't, again, this isn't about like fielding stuff that's not ready yet. This is literally the the, the mm -hmm. first step, just the time it takes to to come up with, you know, to agree to, to something being built. So this is something I know that a lot of people are thinking about. Um, I've heard this, especially in, in the US, but but I guess it's, it's uh, similar elsewhere as well. Um, but yeah, other 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 than that, um, yeah, it basically comes down to to working together more, to communicate more, um, to to keep an eye on on civilian um, uh, developers, um, possibly to be willing to buy more stuff off the shelf, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, but that can be tricky depending on who you buy this. Right. So, um, we had this with parrot drones, I think, because it's Chinese produced and the German military ordered them. But then the boss said, hey, hey do you know what you do? So they use parrot drones and DJI drones too. Uh, exactly. and, DJI, and they use DJI drones. And then you said, do you need Chinese DJI drones for military operations just because you wanted a quick solution? Yes, so that's exactly the example I, I, I would have mentioned. So DJI is a, is a Chinese drone manufacturer, a civilian drone manufacturer. And in fact, not just the leading, but the dominating drone manufacturer. So 90% or so of, of the civilian drones we have, let's say in Germany, are, are most likely DJI produced. Um, Parrot, by the way, is French. So my yeah, drone is a Parrot drone and it's French. Um, so what, what happened is that because DJI was so dominating and their, dr their drones are really good, like they're just like technically really good. Um, what happened is that a number of, of branches of the military bought these systems to use them in military operations. Um, the German Navy, the Dutch Navy, the American Marines, like a number of, of actors, um, which is surprising for two reasons. A, because these were civ civilian systems um, bought for military operations, which in and of itself yeah, is already interesting. Off the shelf, huh? Yeah. And second, because these were Chinese made. And you can wonder whether the American military would have bought another Chinese made system for their, their military operations. Probably not, but, but here they did. And what indeed <laughs> happened is that after a while, people started to realize that could be a problem because you know we're using these systems for surveillance and there is a big question for DJI drones, like where do they send the data to? Um, metadata, but also data in terms of you know, the videos. Like, is this being sent to China? And if it's being sent to China, can it be used by you know, the Chinese right. military? And so the, the, the um, US Marines decided to no longer use these systems and, and uh, yeah, a number of, of armed forces uh, follow this. But this really shows like how, how tricky this is to, to do it because in the end, I mean, these military try to do the right thing. They bought a great technological system to a comparatively, you know, mm -hmm. low price, especially for, for a military point of view um, and use them for their, their operations. So they did everything right. And in the end, it was completely wrong. Yeah. So just uh, to show that AI is a tool, private example, on my wedding, I had a parrot drone delivering the rings. Oh. Yes, but my favorite part was even it was um, the Imperial March by Star Wars, the music background, and then the drone came and then delivered the rings and I took them and then we did the rest. Um, I, loved, oh, yeah. I, I love gadgets. 
I mean, I mean, I shouldn't laugh because when I submitted my PhD thesis, I also filmed this with my drone. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> see. Okay. Well, another question from Hendrik. Um, where do you see the ethical differentiator between the deterministic pre-programmed kill decision of systems, for example, naval mines, torpedoes, or autonomous, uh, automatic defense mm -hmm. systems, like the Aegis combat system, versus AI systems? He then asked, is it just our fear of losing control when a with AI because of the non-deterministic nature or something else. I think it's interesting because a pre-programmed torpedo, which is going after heat, for example, there is a there is a software in it. Yes. Um, so first of all, so a number of the the systems that this refers to are in fact. Band, you know, landmines, okay. for instance, where you, you know, just put a mine and then whoever mm -hmm. steps on it, um, these are internationally banned. Doesn't mean okay. that they aren't used anymore, but but right. these are banned exactly because we feel that this is wrong, mm -hmm. um, mainly because it doesn't differentiate between who steps on the mine, okay. right? It doesn't just only go off because if the there's kill a soldier, is but it's set. It's like random. It, it, the kill decision is set and it doesn't differentiate between um, who is getting killed, which is why we have all these cases of, you know, child stepping on, on these mines and, and getting blown up, which is terrible. So these so these are bans, banned. It is true that a number of other systems, you know, aren't banned where you have a, a ready-made kill decision. So let's take the underwater torpedo. So yes, you tell it, you know, go after... Um, of the whatever a heat source but of course this is a very limited scenario in that you still have let's say the the, the commander in the um in the submarine mm -hmm. who is fighting a a known enemy somewhere there sends out a torpedo and says go for the for the heat source i mean they have a very good idea of what they're likely to to uh, destroy things can go wrong absolutely but if things go wrong if whatever this torpedo goes up it another heat source and it's exactly the, the, the human, human took the took decision. the decision to send out this torpedo and had a good idea of what it could do and so the responsibility is is with the human the moment you have kind of too much ai with too much autonomy there is a question of who is responsible mm -hmm. um to what extent can you still mm, put the responsibility on, on the person who sent it out if they didn't just send it out and say you know this is the, the the target you should you should engage but but just kind of let it roam free and decide on on the target um by itself i think this is this is a a very important question and then really the, the question is don't we if if we kill someone so we're really talking lethal systems mm -hmm. so against human beings and not against whatever radar systems if if another human being is killed don't we owe us to our kind of common humanity that someone feels responsible, takes on this weight of having killed another human being? And you can say that this is whatever idealistic, but this is one of the, you know, cultural or, or civilization territory advances of, of, of our society. And do we really just want to give this up because it's, you know, easier and, and faster and, and, and all of that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that we should. And this leads to the question from Wolfgang asking, what do you think about the idea of a political ban of autonomous lethal weapons? Will mm -hmm. like this ever happen? And my, my person is, I know that a lot of people propose it, but in the moment one or two actors don't act to it, uh, it's game theory. So it only works if everyone is doing it or yeah. else someone else will have an advantage. So this is a big discussion that we currently have, particularly in Geneva um, at the United Nations mm -hmm. within the framework of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons or CCW. So for a few years now, they've heard experts and they've been debating whether or not to ban, or basically they've been debating on whether or not to have the, the discussion on whether or not to ban mm -hmm. um, lethal autonomous weapon systems. And my take on this is that I think it's extremely important and extremely good that we're having these debates in Geneva, um, because it allows us to define certain things and come to certain agreements. 
personally, I don't think that there will be a ban. And if there will be a ban, it will be so specific that it's really easy to find loopholes. Mm -hmm. Because banning stuff is actually really tricky unless it's something very distinct. And the one thing that AI and, and, and autonomous weapons aren't is distinct. It can be a number of things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that they couldn't come up with something that's very clear and, and where you really ban what you what you want to um, ban. And I also don't think that countries will agree, mm -hmm. will agree to that. But that doesn't mean that the debate is, is pointless. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, I think it's, it's very important. Um, when it comes to game theory, I mean, you're right. And so, I mean, the, an American, um, I think it was the undersecretary um, uh, of, 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 of defense or, or something or other um, not too long ago, who basically said what you were just saying, where he said, like, we don't want to build a Terminator, but if others do, we will respond. And of course, that is the big danger. And this is why I'm genuinely worried about arms race dynamics um, in this area of autonomous weapons. And I say this as someone who's always said that there is no arms race in the dynamic when it comes to drones. So I, I'm always a bit critical of what you call an arms race. But, but when it comes to autonomous weapons, there is a, cre there is a clear uh, incentive to react if someone acts. And this leads to the polls I have created. And in case you haven't checked them yet, next to the chat there are questions. There's a poll. And I have asked how should AI and security and defense tools be regulated and 100% as say there needs to be a high regulation and control however it is legal. So they say, except this point, you can't make it illegal because then you can't control it. It has to be high area, you know, high control, but it should be allowed. And mm. then I also ask um, the impact of autonomous weapon systems is, and then 70% said hard to predict, instability and risk will increase. Yeah, I agree. I agree with the hard to predict um, thing. Um, I mean, there's the the kind of positive view that if you increase, for instance, if you increase AI enabled surveillance, that could help decrease conflicts mm -hmm. because there are less misunderstandings. Prevention, right? Yes, exactly. less misunderstandings, better reconnaissance and. Prevention. I mean, I have a portfolio company called Aver. They know they can predict crimes or incidents, or even terrorism, before it happens. Not on the single oh, person, right. but in regions, which is provenly we know that Palante has prevented what twenty attacks. They say sometimes in the in the tech scene, um, because they had the data. They could. We we never know, but they can prevent something before it explodes. Not always, but often. Yeah, that's very minority report. Um, oh yes, but, it's yeah. real. But less human, it's just software. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's one that's one scenario. Um, but the other is that too much reconnaissance, too much surveillance could actually be really really counterproductive for international stability. Why? Well, okay. we are currently seeing. There's this theory that that soonish it will be possible to turn the oceans transparent, mm -hmm. meaning that with a combination of sensors and and mm -hmm. yeah basically ai and forecasting on all of that it will be possible to say where is what in the oceans mm -hmm. i mean again sounds mm -hmm. sounds great more reconnaissance, more yet? surveillance no interesting um, i thought they would know it no i would play sensors everywhere things, yeah but one of the things we don't know is where are the uh submarines mm -hmm. from nuclear states mm -hmm. that transport these nuclear states so-called second strike capabilities. So nuclear deterrence generally works that you, you have a nuclear capability and you tell the others, even if you attack me and basically completely destroy me, I'm still able to attack you back and completely destroy you. Yes. So don't, That's don't the idea. dare, exactly, don't dare attacking us. And one of the ways that a lot of countries or, or a lot of countries, I mean, the nuclear states are doing this is by placing nuclear weapons on submarines that are basically you now somewhere in the ocean so that if their country gets completely destroyed they can still have the second like like, like the russia russia submarine which sank and they didn't tell anyone because they say that it might have been a nuclear submarine and all of them had to die 
Right, um, that's a terrible um, uh, yeah, example. But yeah, okay, so, but now combine this with what I just said about mm -hmm. turning the, the oceans transparent. Mm -hmm. If you are able to turn the oceans transparent, you take the second strike, strike capability from these nuclear states. Right. Which means that all of a sudden they can't claim anymore that, you know, if you attack me, I can strike back because now in one strike, an enemy might be able to destroy both your country and your second strike capability. Mm -hmm. And that, one could argue, really undermines international stability because, you know, as much as you might, might hate nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence, so far until now it has worked in the sense that because there was a second strike capability, um, people didn't attack these nuclear uh, states. So that's just kind of one of these unintended consequences that people like us... That's like people interesting. Like so I, I love to play... Um games like civilizations mm -hmm. and there's always this mode of fog of war uh, yes. and it's preventing you to see the true strengths of your enemy because yes. you do you don't want to lose too much i mean you don't start a war if you win by 60 70 percent you start a war if your army is conquering that neighboring by 95 percent otherwise it's not worth it because you have more defense cap points in average but fog of war means I don't know the strengths of the enemy. So the more surveillance we have, it's less harder to hide. I mean, we know all these articles about Chinese military because they use Google Earth and etc. To, to identify and figure this out, how they build it and etc. So it's um, it's it's interesting. And you so so what again is your less so more surveillance, more intelligence means more chance of war or I did. <laughs> well, I, I guess, I guess the, the, yeah, well, the point is, the point is it can go both ways. The point is that there is no perfect answer. The point is, so, so the fog of war, of course, is a concept that that's, you know, huge in, in my area. And one of the very first books I, I read on all of this is actually called Lifting the Fog of War. And this is, you know, back in the 1990s, I think, or 1980s, um, where we had this, this increasing digitization, computerization of the the, yeah, the battlefields mm -hmm. exactly and the the hope at that point was that there would be this revolution in military affairs this this it enabled revolution in military affairs that would make it possible to live fall of war mm -hmm. now i would argue that there is always fall of war mm -hmm. it doesn't it really doesn't the fog of war isn't dependent on on surveillance capabilities it basically is the friction that happens if mm. you know if things happen that you can't 100 percent predict so i would think that you can never um lift the fog of war but if we increase isr capabilities in a way that we just discussed um the point i was making is that it, it really can go both ways and there are good arguments to say that you know if there is more transparency let's say as to the military capabilities and and things like that mm -hmm. from everyone this can help decrease tension and this can help decrease conflicts i think that's a good argument the argument i was making is just that there are lots of unintended consequences um that we also need to take into consideration such as for instance undermining nuclear nuclear okay. terrorists um we have yeah. only seven minutes left and I have two big topics still the okay, one I'm is gonna, the keyword yeah. surveillance capitalism Yes, and the other one is um, at the end. Where are we in Europe? So let's yes, briefly let's touch. Talk let's talk yes. about Europe. Uh, I had Damien Böselager last week, pro-European party. Um, we know Germany is ignoring this topic. We know France is going actively for it. I'm a friend of a European army for costs and several reasons. Give us your opinion. Your opinion, like where we're standing, where are problems, what can be solved, and will it be solved? Okay. Um, so I don't believe in a European army. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's somewhat. Uh, I, I I'm worried that the debate on a European army is wasting a bit of time and brain space of a lot of people um, because I don't think we're gonna have anything resembling a European <laughs> army until there are a United States of Europe. So basically, what I'm saying is that you know we can have a European army if we become a United States By the of way, Europe. And a it war becomes more... could lead to this very fast. So if there is a crisis, crisis sure. always help to unite. If it would be military conflict, this could lead very fast. But I agree. Currently, yeah. there's no need for it to enforce this. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so let's leave the European mm -hmm. army um, um, out of this because this is one of those pet peeves <laughs> of, of, of mine. Um, but okay, let's let's look let's look at Europe and kind of military AI or AI in general. So the first thing to note is that one of my grievances in this whole area is that there is very little attention being paid to 
Europe in this whole debate. So when you look at um, the topic of military AI, AI in the military realm, what happens is that most of the research is focused on the United States mm -hmm. and then quite some on China and then a little bit, let's say, on Russia, Russia and a few others. Exactly. India, Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Israel is, is always an interesting case. Um, and the reason for that is that, I mean, the US is, is leading militarily just by the sheer size of its, its military. Um, and it's definitely a technological leader. So lots of interesting things are happening, let's say, at, at DARPA. Um, and the Chinese focus stems from the fact that, you know, the US is really interested in China. And of course, a lot of things are happening in, in China as well. But this means that there is actually just very little attention being paid and very little research on what Europe can do. And I find this unjustifiable in the sense that, A, stuff is definitely happening in Europe. I mean, we were talking about the future combat air system earlier. We have at least two quite interesting autonomous um, combat drone developments, uh, Neuron and Tyrannus by the French and or by European consortium and by the, the British. Um, we have a lot of data analysis. So th there are definitely things happening in Europe that are worth looking at. And secondly, simply from a European point of view, we should really be interested in this. I mean, I find it really striking how, how many European researchers primarily study, let's say, US developments. I'm not blaming them. This is super interesting. It's just that it's a bit, it's, it's not great for us if we don't really keep an eye on, on, on this. The tough question, are we defensible currently? Without, and I, I, I might see this is because the United States has this umbrella still about us, and I called this at the beginning Vasallenstaat. Um, it works, but let's say America says, oh, Trump is re-elected, I don't care about Europe. Are we defensible? Okay, so this goes way beyond, you know, tech and warfare, right? So you're basically asking about kind of Europeans' defense capabilities. The question is against whom, and indeed in what scenario? So... At the moment, European defense stands reasonably strong okay. because, no, no, but because mm -hmm. of the NATO system, NATO Article mm -hmm. 5, and indeed the US support. Mm -hmm. um, if there was an attack against a European NATO member, the other European, uh, sorry, the other NATO members would come and help, mm -hmm. are more or less contractually obliged to help, although in different ways. Um, and, and all these NATO countries together are pretty much able to defend against, I mean, more or less everything. Mm -hmm. If you take out the United States, if you know the US says we're leaving NATO, we don't care about Europe anymore, we don't care at all, which is an extreme scenario. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the US turning away. I think they will turn away, but there's a difference between saying we don't wanna do everything anymore and we don't care anymore if you get attacked at all. But okay, take this extreme. Then it, of course, depends on against you know who who is attacking. Let's take I don't know Russia. If who Russia, is, who is potential? I mean, it's Russia and China in the media. Only those two could be a threat. I don't see Russia as a threat. Okay, but this is another another. <laughs> let's. Like, um, if you have Russia attacking a European state, if it's an EU state, um, there the EU actually has the same. Article 5 that NATO has, this mm -hmm. idea of, of common defense, the EU also has this. Article 42.7 in the Lisbon Treaty, which pretty much says the same. If one member state is attacked, the others are supposed to help. Again, like helping can mean a lot, a lot of things, but overall it means helping them. So if an EU member state is attacked, you would assume that the other EU member states would help. If you have all the EU's military might against a Russian um, attack, it's it's definitely not clear, you know, that that the Russian side would win. Um, I would I would not claim this. But again, it, in the military realm, it really depends on what exactly are you trying to do. What exactly are you defending? Which type of attack do you mean? Um, if Russia just want just if Russia wanted to invade the Baltics and would could do so very fast, mm -hmm. the EU would definitely have issues um, defending against this this quickly. By the way, NATO would also have problems. Like defending and on the other hand, I, so, I a lot of reports how they move and plan for this. So because we're coming to the end, yeah. um, first learning for me is Europe is defensible, so we don't actually have a physical threat currently, which is good. No one has to uh, be afraid for now that Chinese drones are patrolling here in our streets Ooh. soon. 
or unless we buy them on our own terms. <laughs> Yes. Exactly. So, so yes. A, we already have these systems patrolling because we we bought them. But also, I mean, I definitely in in the military realm, you can never go that extreme because I it's you you can have plausible scenarios where you can have attacks from the outside that we aren't prepared for and aren't being able to defend against. And let's be honest, like European defense capabilities. We are doing great. I mean, the, the Bundeswehr isn't doing great, but even even the Brits and the the French have their issues. Like, let's not pretend that there are that there are no problems. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would I would and I am definitely calling for more uh, defense capabilities, um, investing more in, in in capabilities in order to counter a threat. Just because I don't think that that we can't sleep at night at the moment because there may be an attack and um, tomorrow doesn't mean we should be complacent about this. I think this is very important, mm -hmm. um, important to, to make that point. So my call to action out there is if you're an entrepreneur, consider starting a not military but defense company if you want to. Um, um, because it's a huge market and it's needed for European autonomy at the end. If you're an investor, consider it at least. Don't be so narrow-minded. At the end, it's important for the ecosystems to be refurbished. Um, Ulrike, I thank you. And I hope we see you again live for our summit in November. That would be fun, yeah. Well, thanks for, for having me. We had a you know huge discussion. There's so many more things to say on all of these topics. Um, and the next time we're going to discuss whether whether Russia or anyone else is a, is a threat because I have views on that too. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you for this. I say goodbye to you. Yes, everyone else can pleasure. stay for a line. Um, well, for you, our uh, next virtual chat is in two weeks and it's with Prof Professor Christian Kersting. And we speak about the third wave of AI. So we will speak very technical about AI. Um, he was recommended to me by Gary Marcus, um, and we will talk about you know how can we build the next level of intelligent systems. He calls it robust AI, um, hybrid systems. Um, you know how to put all these pieces together. Um, also, I would like to point out we have a summit, hybrid summit, 17th and 18th of November here in Berlin. So we will try out have a limited hundred people physical here, like here is in the studio and. You know, beyond, we have a couple of stages, and Ulrike uh, will be on one of those stages. And but we will open it. We will stream everything. We will have the same networking platform. It will be accessible for everyone from all over the world. So you don't have to fly to Berlin to attend and to network and to learn. And um, that I would say is it for today. It was as usual pleasure. Good questions. Very lively interaction. I thank Ulrike again. Thank you for attending. And if you're just listening in. Um, it was great and there will more come. Check out her podcast if you want to have a deep dive. Thank you and goodbye.